Well, thank you, Dr. Pace, and just want to say it's an honor to be with you today, and so thankful for uh, Dr. Aiken's invitation to spend uh, these few moments preaching in chapel. Uh, means the world to me, and uh, means a lot to me and both my wife Candy, and so very thankful for that. Just want to say it's an honor to be here uh, with you all in such a special place for us. Now, if you have, I'll go ahead and get you started. If you got your Bibles out, because we're here to hear the Word. Go ahead and start turning to Romans chapter 8. We'll be in the end of the chapter, starting in verse 35. I'll be in the ESV, so if you have a device and you can switch over to it, you're welcome to follow along there. But we'll be, we'll be at the end of Romans chapter 8 today, but I do want to say just a word of uh, just what this place has meant to me and my wife Candy. We actually met here at Southeastern, and we met, uh, we, would, we, we lived, we were neighbors in Flaherty, but we would sit next to each other in chapel. So you might be sitting next to your wife today uh, in chapel if that plays out. And uh, now's not the time to put the moves on, by the way. Uh, so we would go after chapel and go over to Shorty's and get a hot dog. So um, we would do that with some regularity. I'll try to get you out in time to get, it was always a tight schedule to get over there to get a hot dog in time for the next class. And maybe I just made that hot dog lunch a little more awkward for you and whoever you go with today. So either way, so much, so thankful for this place, what it means just, just to be able to come back a place. I, I didn't know what expositional preaching was when I got here, had no idea. And uh, what an impact it had to learn how to preach the word here. And just an honor for me to come back and just walk through a text with you today. So here's what I'd like to do. If you'd stand in honor of the reading of his word, just as we did a moment ago, just to mark this moment out, we are hearing God speak to us. So we'll begin Romans chapter 8, verse 35. The word of God says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any Thing else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this encouraging word here from your, from your uh, word to us. And Lord, we ask now that you would strengthen us with this great truth that no matter what we face, we will always be united with you. Lord, strengthen us to live boldly and confidently, no matter what's on the horizon, to know we can always trust your work in our lives. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I'm guessing you've had this experience before, but if you're ever in a, a large city and you're walking down a sidewalk, and as you walk down that sidewalk, you'll You'll be walking along, you're looking along the, the ground, and, and all of a sudden you'll come up on a, what looks like a grate or some form of uh, a drain. And normally where it might only be a couple of feet deep, but you take a couple of steps, you look down, and it might be 30 or 40 feet down in this drain. And in your mind you think, you know, that I know people walk across this thing all day long. I know it's been here for a really long time. But in your mind, you take a hesitant moment. You think, can I, can I take a step and put my full weight on it? And in fact, some of you, I, I bet, you probably even walk around these grates. Anybody do that? You, you, you get on it, you get a little afraid. You, you'll actually avoid stepping on something even though you know it's trustworthy. How much weight can you put on your relationship with Christ? If you're a follower of Christ, you truly have placed your faith in him, will your faith last? Will you always stay united with him no matter what's around the horizon? You know, it's easy to say that, but you start 
thinking about the worries of life, which you guys have. I mean, if we go across this room, you've got things that are sitting on the horizon, something next week, next month. And you start to think, man, will my faith be able to withstand that? Will I be able to make it through what's around the corner? So Paul asked that same question in a little different way in verse 35. you got your Bibles there in front of you. Look what it says. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And you could say who or what. It's a, it's a matter of a person or a thing. Is there, is there anything that sits on the horizon for you that stands to threaten your union with Christ? That, that you somehow, your faith will fail or you won't make it? Is there anything that sits out there? Paul answers the question simply in verse 37 when he says, no. He says, no, there's not anything that could ever separate you from the love of Christ, that once you are with him, once you are saved, a follower of his, you will always be a follower of his. That's what we believe, right? We believe there's, that once you place your faith in Christ, you won't lose your salvation. We call this you know, perseverance of the saints. Or you could, you could speak about this in ways where you say that there's no way you'll ever lose your salvation. Now, we know that truth, but oftentimes we forget it in the day-to-day. Because if you have genuine faith in Christ, it will overcome all obstacles. Anything that sits on your horizon, your faith will overcome that. So if I want to take these few moments here today, I want to take this text. It's a, it's a great text of Scripture. And I want us to just meditate on just how Christ is going to carry us through. And we'll spend just our time thinking on the things here in front of us. I pray it's an encouragement. I know that this room is diverse. You, some of you are freshmen in college all the way to you, you're living life in all kinds of ways. But I pray this would be a, an encouragement to where the Lord has placed you today. And so if you're taking notes, if you're writing stuff down, here, here's the first way that I believe your genuine faith overcomes. It overcomes your circumstances, your circumstance, whatever is in front of you, whatever you are in, your faith will overcome that. You know, Paul lists here in the text seven biographical circumstances, things that he's not just speaking about as he's in a lab, he's actually lived these things in verse 35. If you flip over, we're not going to do it now, but later you can go read 2 Corinthians 11, Uh, Verse 24 to 28, you'll be able to see Paul describing how he's lived the things that are in this text. So when he gives this list, he's not speaking as a person who doesn't really know what these things are like. He's actually experienced them. I'll try to group them together for you as we look at them. And the first deal with the pressures we face in life, look there in verse 35 with me. It says, shall tribulation or distress or persecution. These are all areas of pressure on your faith. When you talk about tribulation, we're talking about being squeezed under pressure, to to have pressure placed on your life and your faith in the Lord. The idea of being distressed is is almost a claustrophobic term. You're you're hemmed in. You don't know where to go. The the pressures in front of you kind of leave you without a knowledge of what's on the horizon. And then persecution is the threat of injury or death. It's the suffering for the sake of Christ. So so in Paul's context, he's in deep suffering, right? I mean, he's going to be persecuted for his faith, so we know we're looking at a pretty significant uh, deal there. We, We probably don't face that here. Some of you, if you feel called to the mission field, you might see this stuff firsthand. But we'll just experience echoes of this in our life the pressures on our faith that will test us. And and you begin to wonder, will my faith hold up tomorrow? Can it withstand these pressures? And Paul says, let me tell you something. No matter what pressure you will face, your faith, your union with Christ will hold up. Look at the next two. Not only is it your pressures, but it can be your poverty. Seminary, you might feel that more than other times in life, right? (laughs) This is not the place you come to get 
uh, rich and live with wealth. You, this is a time of sacrifice for learning. But notice his two terms here. He says famine and nakedness. He, he's speaking about the two most basic parts of life, right? Food and clothing. And I don't know if he necessarily means being completely naked or completely without food. But what we're talking about here is not having the basics of life, being destitute or in poverty or this, this might be having zero dollars in your bank and no option for where you can go get help. Paul says that even if every bit of your bank account is gone, your food is gone, and your clothing is gone, your faith won't fail. No matter what comes on the horizon. See, so you build that big up and you say, well, I'm just kind of worried about this one paycheck or this one bill. Paul says, let me tell you, it's going to take a lot more than that to even put a risk at your union with the love of Christ. The last one is the most serious, and it's the peril of death. Notice the last two words. He says danger or sword. He's meaning the, the danger of persecution or what a sword might bring would be death. So even if the blood in your veins ceased to pump, and the air in your lungs ceased to come in and out, it's still impossible to separate you from the love of Christ. You see, Paul had faced all of these dangers. Like I said, this is a thing he has lived out, and he knows whether it's pressure or poverty or peril, there is nothing that will sit on the horizon that will put his faith and his connection to Christ in danger. You see, these things are like bugs on the windshield of a car. They might be messy, they might obscure your vision, but, but no bug is going to stop a car from going down the road. The same thing for you today. These struggles you might have in life might be things that obscure your vision. They might be messy, but your faith won't fail. Now, just to be clear here, this means genuine faith, right? There are tests of faith in the Bible where people fail. There's the parable of the soils where it looks like genuine faith, but it doesn't play through. So the point here is that genuine faith in Christ won't fail. It will carry you through. You know, I had a, I had a car when I was in seminary. Speaking of poverty, it was the seminary car. It, it wasn't uh, much of a car, and I, when I left here, my wife and I, we moved to Charlotte, and the car started giving me trouble. And what it would do is when you would start to push the gas, if you, if you just slightly pushed it, you were fine. But if you ever pushed it with any sort of uh, acceleration, it sputtered and wouldn't move very well. So it took, some, it took some skill to drive this car. In fact, Candy quit driving it. She wouldn't drive it anymore because it was frankly dangerous. Because if you try to pull out in front of a car, it was over. You you couldn't actually move out of the way. And, and so I had this car, and I was trying to get it fixed. And so I thought, well, I'm going to take this car to the mechanic and get it fixed. And so I, I drop it off this uh, mechanic shop, and they, they go in, and they, they call me in like this is a serious chat. You could tell the mechanic's having a hard time telling me this. And he said, well, let me, let me tell you something, sir. Uh, I, I figured out the problem, but I want you to know that the cost to fix the car, anybody ever been here, is more than the car's actually worth. So we'd reached a point that my car was totaled without even getting in a wreck. And so he, here I am turning, turning in this car. I realize it, it, it's not reliable. So when I push the gas, when I press on it, it's not going to respond. And, and here's all I want to just encourage you with today is, is to say that if you've placed your faith in Christ and what sits on your horizon may be something that scares you, what what Paul says is you can push the gas on that faith and it's never going to fail you. Christ and your union with him will never fail. So if you're looking at where God might call you around the corner or even what's difficult about the day, he says, you know what, will anything ever separate you from Christ? He says, absolutely not, no matter what circumstance you're in. But it's not just circumstances. Let's press that a little bit deeper. Here's the second thing. Genuine faith overcomes all suffering. 
Because our circumstances sometimes get to be difficult and we start to suffer. You know, life's not one big vacation. And sometimes we think, if I'm just faithful to God, then on the backside of this, God's going to always make these things where I don't have to suffer. But that's not going to happen because Paul wants you to know that from the very beginning, we've always had to suffer. He, is this quotation here from Psalm 44. Do you see it there? Verse 36 with me. He's given that long list, and then he just kind of jumps over. He's like, why is he quoting a psalm in the middle of this beautiful statement? Look what he says. He says, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. And Paul wants to look back and say, you know what? Even from a long time ago, people suffered in the faith. Then he steps into this Roman context and said, let me tell you something. People suffered in faith. John Calvin said it when he said, it is no new thing for the Lord to permit his saints to be undeservedly exposed to the cruelty of the ungodly. It's no new thing because he knew suffering, Paul knew suffering, and the psalmist knew suffering. So when we come to Christ today and we are united with him, suffering is a part of the journey. Even in knowing Christ, we share in his sufferings. I, I want to just give you a, a little glimmer into this end of verse 37. Look at it with me again. It says, knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who Look at the last phrase there, loved us. Notice there, it's in the past tense. We want to step into the Greek. It's in the aorist tense. It's in the past. So how Christ has loved us in the past was on the cross. So the way Christ loves me and you was through suffering. So if you're going to know Christ and be united with him, you're going to be united with his suffering. So, so the same way, if you're gonna, if it's gonna say, how will you ever be separated from the love of Christ? If you're united, you're gonna know what suffering means. The suffering is a part of the normal expectation for the Christian life. You know, as a as a pastor, as I work with people, one of the things that is what's going on in our culture and our world as Christians. You know, the world just drifting away from any sort of biblical mindset. A lot of times people are trying to process, why is the world leaving these Christian values? One of the things I tell our people is that this time in America that we've had of great, you know, prosperity for the Christian life is not normal. It's abnormal in history. We are going back to what's been more normal now. The, the expectation is that the church would suffer. You know, I uh, like to exercise every now and then, and I, uh, a couple years ago, got me one of these Apple Watches. Anybody got an Apple Watch in the room? So, so on the Apple Watch, everybody checks it right now, make sure it's good to go. So you got your Apple Watch, and on the Apple Watch, they have these exercise rings. And I've got to the point, it may be a mental issue, but I feel like if I don't, if I don't exercise with my Apple Watch, it doesn't count, right? It, if I don't record it on there, so if I go on a run and it's not recorded on my Apple Watch, I don't feel like it counts. So I feel like I have to do it on there. But one of the interesting things on the Apple Watch is that you can set the bar for what fills out a ring. So if you're going to exercise, I think the standard's about 30 minutes a day to spend exercising. So if you set that standard and you do it for a day, you get 30 minutes, the ring is full, and there's something really satisfying about seeing that complete at the end of the day. The, the same thing uh, could work. You could make it two hours. I've been tempted to make it five minutes so my ring is full every day, right? So, so the, the expectation matters to how you feel at the end. And some of us have built an expectation that the love of Christ always means warm fuzzies and a vacation on the beach, but when it means that we'll never separate it from the love of Christ here, it actually means suffering is coming. But suffering that we can always endure because nothing is out there that can threaten our walk with the Lord. Here's the third thing, if you're taking notes. Genuine faith overcomes any power. There's nothing 
that exists in all of creation that can threaten your union with Christ. So let's take this text as I did a moment ago. It's a list again. He lists 10 things here. I'll help you read it. There's eight of them that are in pairs. Then I'll pull two out at the end. So I'll try to do them in pairs. Hang with me. We're going to be walking through each one. But I, I hope this is an exercise. My, my goal today was not to come in here and just talk about uh, things on my mind. I want to spend these moments meditating on the Word. So as I go through this list, I want you to meditate on Christ's security in, his, in your life. So here, here's the first one is death and life. Look at verse 38. For I am sure that neither death nor life. So that means there is nothing in your current life or in your future death that can separate you from the love of Christ. There's no spiritual danger in the present moment that you can even conceive of. And then one day, all of us are going to close our eyes in death. And while we have great faith about what's going to happen, let's be real, none of us in this room have ever died before. None of us have ever stepped and seen that. So there's a moment of faith when we close our eyes for that last time, stepping into the afterlife and thinking, what happens there? Here he says, there is nothing that exists in your death that will separate you from the love of Christ. So neither life nor death. That's why the psalmist says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. That, that's what gives us the confidence. So that's death or life. The next one, angels or rulers. You see the spiritual realm here. So we've gone to death, life. Now we're going to the spiritual world. That means that there are no demonic powers. I, uh, demons are real. So there's no, no demon or demonic power that you can dream of. I'm talking about laying in bed at night, thinking about this, messing with your head, thinking about some of the demonic influences. And especially if you go to the front lines of the mission field, you're going to start to see demonic activity in these ways. There is nothing in that spiritual realm that can threaten your union with Christ. Now let's go to time. Look, look there with me at time, both the future and the present. Look what he says, nor things present, nor things to come. There, that means anything right now and anything in the future. There's nothing that could present a threat to your Union with Christ in this moment, and there's nothing that could happen in the future. Now, worry is, uh, whenever we worry about things, it's usually in the future, is it not? Worry doesn't happen in the present. That's why you hear people talk about, you know, you say, I'm going to get up and, and speak in front of a group of people, and you're worried, you're worried, you're worried. And then everybody says, man, I got up there, and guess what happened? My nerves went away, I was comfortable, right? It's, everybody gets in the moment, and because it's not near as bad as you thought, the worry goes away. And so for, for you today, when you think about the future, that there is nothing that sits on the horizon that can threaten your walk with Christ. Look, look elsewhere here, the universe. It, it, look what he says here, nor height, nor depth. So that means you can go to the center of the earth with the smallest molecule you can imagine and you will find nothing there that can threaten your union with Christ. And you can go to the farthest galaxy in the corner of the universe into the deepest black hole you can find and there will be nothing there that can threaten your relationship with Christ. From both the microscope to the telescope, there is nothing that can separate you from the love of Christ. Then he says, if I haven't made my point enough, he gets to everything. And I'll just pull these two terms together. The end of verse 38, he says, nor powers. He, he just gives the whole list. And then he says in verse 39, nor anything else in all of creation. He says, if I've forgotten something, if there's anything else on this list that I have forgotten, it's included in all of creation. But he didn't just stop there. He didn't just say that your faith can handle every attack. 
He actually says it's more. And here's the fourth thing, is that genuine faith overcomes your weakness. It overcomes any sense of attack because when you are attacked, it actually becomes your strength. Look at verse 37. I've saved it for this because this text works like a mountaintop, a chiasm. It's where it builds up and comes down, and in the middle he makes this statement. Look at it with me. We'll focus on 37 the rest of our time. No, in all of these things, everything we've listed, not only are we not threatened, he says we are more than conquerors. We're not just going to overcome. We're going to, as he says here, super or hyper overcome. He exaggerates, pressing on the language to make us see that our ability to overcome whatever obstacle will be over the top. We don't just we aren't just threatened by it, but the Lord is going to use it for our good. That's why Romans 8, 28, just a few verses before, right, where he says that in all things he's going to work for the good of those who love him. So that means that even when the attack comes or even anything in this list happens, not only is it not going to threaten us, it's actually going to press us closer to Christ. The attacks are our victory. This is hard to think. I, I honestly, as I've been meditating, I hope as you've walked through this text with me, the past few days and things I'm worried about and things that are pressing on me, difficult conversations I've had or whatever pressures I have, I, I've been thinking and going, you know what, God, those are things I look in a negative light, but in fact, because of this text, those are to my good. You know, one of my children, I have three children, my oldest is 12, and uh, she is a somewhat like me. When she lays down her head on the pillow at night, her mind just goes. Anybody like this? You, you, at night, you're just, your mind is racing. It's hard to go to sleep. But not only is she like that, she, she desires to have life's philosophical greatest questions. That, that the time for those is 1030 at night. And I'm old now, and I don't stay up late like I used to, and I want to go to bed. And, you know, if it was one night, it'd be one thing, but I, I'm not trying to exaggerate. It's almost every night. There are these major life questions, and I think, man, I, I, I got to answer them while my daughter's here, and then eventually after the 30th straight night, we just got to take a break, you know. But she asked things like, why, why does God allow things to be so difficult? And she asks all these things, and so then you're, as a parent, you're in this situation where you're, you're now having the, the dad talk, right? You're, you're the guru, and you're having to give the answers. And I remember a moment for me as I was, you know, you'll, you'll be talking to your child, and you'll, when you're sharing something with them, you, you pull from places in your life you've learned things, right? You'll go back and you'll say, Hey, babe, let me tell you, when I was this age or I was this age, this is where I learned something. And you know what I learned? I realized one day, every story I told came from a difficulty I had in life. I mean, you start talking about the things that shape you. Like, If we were to sit down and just have lunch and coffee and we say, what are the things you look back and say, man, those are the things that made me the the man I am, those are the things that made me the godly woman that I am today. They're almost always in the list of suffering and difficulty. Because for the believer, the Lord takes the attacks from a sinful world and he makes them your victory. He makes them what draws you to Christ. So when Paul lives, gives this list of things you might threaten you, he comes out saying, no, 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 let me tell you how you are with these things. You are a super conqueror. You aren't threatened by these. These are actually your victory. But then there's one last piece here, and there's the fifth thing I would give you, is that genuine faith overcomes in Christ alone. It is only by Christ. I know sometimes it's tempting to think it 
you got some strength and you're able to do these things on your own. But look at his, look at his verbiage there in verse 37 with me again. No, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him. The only way that you can persevere is through God himself. This is, like I said, we call this the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. That saints would persevere to the end. John Stott, when he comments on this text, he said, actually, we should call it the doctrine of the perseverance of God with the saints. He's the one carrying us through. If it was based on us, we would fail, but it's based on the work of Christ, knowing that he's the one that makes us able. So the only reason that you can be a super conqueror and that you can look at all the things that threaten you in tomorrow is in Christ alone. Now, my hope has been, this has been a few moments in the word to encourage you. I'd ask you to keep your Bibles open. Before I pray and before we conclude, what I'd like to do is just read the text one more time. And I pray as after we've meditated on it for a few moments, that as I read this text, you would leave confident in Christ alone. So, so read it with me again. Just hear it with your ears and be encouraged by it. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sore. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. But no, 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 there's no, nothing, right? In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. To the praise of Christ, we walk confidently out of here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we fix our eyes on King Jesus today, the one who carries us through. And Lord, I, I know that there's a lot of struggle ahead for all of us in this room. It's a broken, sinful world. We step to do ministry and serve you, and our desire is that the kingdom would expand. But, Lord, we know there's opposition. And so, Lord, today we pray that you would give us confidence in you making us more than conquerors in anything we face. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.